So Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 23, uh, you can find it on page 1099. We're picking up as uh, Peter and John uh, have just been imprisoned. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Well, do keep that Uh, open in front of you and uh, the inside of your yellow service sheet will uh, have a bit of an outline of where we're going. The question this morning really is when it feels as if the whole world is against God and the gospel, what will you do? Kate Forbes, the uh, Scottish National Party MSP, was uh, written about in the papers during her leadership campaign Uh, as an extreme Christian whose views couldn't be tolerated by modern society. Uh, Tim Farron, the former leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, stepped down convinced that a Christian can no longer effectively lead a political party. These are famous examples, but the reality is that it reflects a lot of what we see in our culture, in our popular culture, in our media, in our social media, what it says about Christians. Your views aren't right. Or you can be a Christian, but keep it to yourself. Maybe at your work, you've been told it's best to be quiet about being a Christian here. It can be quite a scary thing, a difficult thing, and something that we need God's help for. We're looking in Acts, this account of the first Christians, first followers of the risen Jesus Christ. And after he ascends, he sends his spirit to empower his followers to be witnesses to the very ends of the earth, we saw in Acts chapter 1. And we're picking up today, uh, just after Peter and John, two of Jesus' followers, had been hauled in front of a massive trial at the temple because they had healed a lame man, a man who couldn't walk. And they said before uh, all the heads and rulers and powerful people that it's the risen Jesus whom you crucified that has empowered us to do this. And they get threatened. They get told, don't speak about Jesus anymore. They're told to no longer say such things. Essentially, shut up about Jesus. It's a threat. And so what do they do? Well, when the world seems against the gospel and against God, they pray to him. Look at verse 23 with me. When they are released, they went to their friends, repeated what the chief priests and elders had said to them. What did they report back? Well, if we sort of uh, scoot back to verse 18, we can see that uh, Peter and John were, uh, they, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And verse 21, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go. So Peter and John, probably feeling quite fortunate to have escaped with their lives from uh, this big trial, 
Uh, they go back to other believers, the apostles, uh, and those who'd likely come to faith through the apostles' teaching. And when they hear what was said and done to Peter and John, and how they've been threatened and told, be quiet about Jesus, don't talk about him anymore, they pray to God. Look how they pray. First, we see who they're praying to. The sovereign creator God who has spoken. Verse 24, when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. First, the sovereign Lord. It means the God who is powerful, in control, who rules over all things. They start their prayer. God, you're in control. You're in charge. And in fact, we see verse uh, 28, that even uh, they say, even those against God do whatever his hand and his plan uh, has predestined to take place. Basically, all the people against God, they're doing what he's decided will happen. God, you're in control. They say you're the one who has decided what will happen. Now, maybe you're here today and the question immediately comes to your mind. Well, if God is in control, what's the point in them praying to God who is in control, who knows everything that's going to happen, who has predestined things to take place? So what's the point in prayer? I guess the second question that follows on naturally is, well, does prayer actually even change anything? Well, the sovereign God commands by his holy word that we pray. It's not an option for a Christian. It's required. We're told to do uh, all things through prayer and supplication in Philippians 4. And scripture is very, very clear uh, that prayer changes things. If we uh, don't seek God in a biblically informed way, uh, James 4, 2 says, you don't have because you don't ask. Essentially saying uh, that uh, prayer changes things if we seek God in a biblically informed way. There's plenty that can be said philosophically, uh, theologically, uh, from, but those are the two headlines. Christians are told in God's word to pray, and they're told uh, that their prayer changes things. The sovereign Lord. Next, the creator God. Verse 24 again, God is a sovereign Lord who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in it. He made everything. You. Me. The, the people sitting next to us. The mountains, the seas, the people who put Peter and John on trial and threatened them. God has made them all. The details of their life are open before him in such a way, uh, almost as if uh, the, the uh, characters of an author writing a novel are best known by that author himself. So we are known by the author of life. He is the creator God who knows all things, who made us. And he's the God who has spoken. Verse 25, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. He's not a distant God. He's not a God who has made everything, is sovereign over everything, but has sort of pressed play and has stepped back. No, he's a God who has revealed himself to us, not just in what he's made, but in what he has said through scripture. So these earliest followers of Jesus, they recognize that the powerful creator God is not silent, but has spoken. How has he done that? Well, through scripture here, it's the Holy Spirit who has spoken through David. David was an ancient king. He wrote many of the, the Psalms and we had Psalm 2 uh, read earlier. David uh, wrote that. And we see here that the apostles believe that God spoke through David and that there's one consistent picture in all of scripture. And so rather than saying, as you sometimes hear in modern times, that we can uh, discard the Old Testament because we've got the New Testament, they're sort of different depictions of God. No, the earliest Christians, they thought uh, this is one consistent uh, picture what is, what is this consistent picture? Well, that the world is against God and his gospel. Look what David said in Psalm 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? Uh, chapter 426 here, 
the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. Here David is speaking about how it seems that all the world is against God and his anointed. His anointed means his chosen king. And so we have the Gentiles, all those who aren't Jewish. The peoples, a term uh, for those uh, of Israel, the kings of the earth, the rulers, basically everyone from high to low, far and wide, David said, is against God and his chosen king. And there were times when David really felt this. He wrote it trying to take possession of his kingdom and struggling to do so. And he went through seasons of terrible opposition. It seemed like everybody was against God, his king and his plan. But look what David makes clear. In the midst of all of this opposition, it's foolishness, isn't it? For them to be pitching themselves against God, they, they plot, but it's in vain. They rage, they set themselves, they gather, but it's in vain. It's foolish to oppose God. The whole world has set itself against God since the very first humans rebelled against him. And it's been that way ever since, again and again and again. It's what the Bible calls sin. Each one of us in our natural state is guilty of it. And David says, it's foolishness. The apostles and the early followers of Jesus were reading this, and they saw that while it was speaking about David's time struggling to take possession of his kingdom, they understood that this was also foretelling what was going to happen to Jesus. So look at verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hands and your plan are predestined to take place. Do you see what they're saying here? Do you see what's going on? The Lord said it through David, but we've seen it with our own eyes in this city. The anointed one, Jesus, God's chosen saviour, killed by the peoples. Pilate, Herod, these rulers, they all set themselves against Jesus to kill him. But in their prayer here, these early Christians, what do they say? This was God's plan. Hundreds and hundreds of years before, when David wrote these things, it was the Holy Spirit working through him, foretelling God's plan to save his people from their sin. God orders all things by his secret will and brings things to pass that he determines, even through the work of the seemingly wicked. The chief and sole direction of all that happens in this world. When the Gentiles rage, they held on a lead held by God. When a dog is on a lead, it is able to bark, but it can be reined in in a moment's notice. This is what these earliest Christians do when they're faced with threats. They pray and acknowledge that God is the sovereign creator Lord who has spoken. And there's one consistent picture that the world is against God, but that God's plan has come to pass. And it's the basic good news, isn't it? That the holy servant Jesus was anointed and killed uh, so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Now, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're just exploring the things of Jesus. Consider this. The apostles here, the, the very first Christians, uh, they have just been warned by the most powerful people to be quiet. They've been warned to not speak about Jesus being raised from the dead. Now, I think that uh, this really lends credit to them. Because they weren't making this up in order to be uh, powerful. It's quite clear that they weren't... Uh, conjuring up a story in order to be popular they were threatened and in fact we'll see in Acts as they go on uh, that they uh, die for this truth I think it lends credibility to them it's not that they want to make money from this it's not that they want to get powerful it really happened they were really threatened and they really prayed like this now if we're here today as a Christian a question for us is do we pray like this Beginning with the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty, his glory as creator and his desire to be known in him speaking. Do we have that biblically informed prayer life of these early Christians? When the world seems like it is against God and the gospel, the first thing to do is to pray. 
And then what do they pray for? When all the world feels like it's against the sovereign creator God who said that it would be this way. Verse 29, now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Even though they know a God is the sovereign Lord who is powerful over all things, they ask him to pay close attention to the threats they've come under. They ask him to pay attention to what's going on in their lives right now. We see more of how prayer works then, don't we? It's a relationship for our benefit. Maybe think of it like this. Uh, my wife and I are very close. We often know what the other is going to say in a moment uh, before we've even said it. But does that mean that we don't spend time deliberately communicating on a, on a deeper level, sharing what is on our mind and on our heart, and that it's not a joy to do so? Prayer is that relationship between us and that sovereign creator, Lord. J.C. Ryle was a bishop a long time ago who said that prayer is a sign of a spiritual life like breathing is a sign of physical life. It's part of our natural relationship with God. So it's natural that we bring our worries to him. And what do they ask of God? That he would uh, smite those who threaten them? That he would give strength to defeat all enemies? That he would... Uh, get, give them the, the cunning to outsmart them. Now, what do they pray for? Verse 29, they pray for boldness, that they would continue to speak the word with boldness, that he would stretch out his hands to heal. Signs and wonders would be performed through the name of Jesus. Now, we'll look in a lot more detail about signs and wonders in a couple of weeks' time. But sufficient to say for now, the apostles uh, pray for uh, that, that healing would happen rather than miraculous sort of harm on their enemies, which is interesting, isn't it? They're not looking for uh, vengeance on those making threats, but for uh, God to work good healing through them. But what would it be like for us to pray for boldness, boldness in speaking the word? Because when we feel like we can't speak up as Christians, this is a great prayer for us to pray. Have you prayed it before? <coughs> that God would help you to speak his word with boldness. When family say, we're not interested in hearing about your faith. When your boss says, just, you know, uh, FYI, people are going to think that you should probably be quiet about Jesus at work. We don't really do faith here. When your children's school says to you, um, your child has some pretty concerning views on faith. We'd like to talk to you about them. And then they object to some basic gospel truths. In those moments, what do we say? Well, these early believers have it right. They want to speak the word of God with boldness. The word of God, we're told elsewhere, uh, is powerful. So while good arguments from history, philosophy, morality are all really helpful and useful, one of the most effective things we can do is share that word of God, that good news of Jesus from his word. In these moments when it feels like there's pressure, when the heat is on, pray for boldness. Now, you might not immediately feel a sort of immediate swell of bravery. Uh, it might not be a moment of, uh, you know, brave hearts, William Wallace shouting, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. It might not be the surge of, of courage, the King Theoden, Lord of the Rings, uh, spears will be shaken, shields will be splintered. What would courage look like? Well, we see lots of times in the book of Acts where this prayer is answered. In uh, Antioch, Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly when the Jews publicly reviled them, Acts 13. In Iconium, they were vigorously opposed, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, Acts 14.3. In Ephesus, Apollos spoke boldly in the synagogue, Acts 18. In uh, Ephesus, again, Paul taught in the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God in Acts 19. In Caesarea, when Paul was imprisoned, he spoke boldly, 
to the king Agrippa in Acts 26. And the last thing we know about Paul is that while under house arrest in Rome, he went on proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, Acts 28. It looks like wherever these Christians are, whatever difficulty they're facing, whatever opposition they've come up against, in different contexts, they speak differently, sometimes with lots of reasoning over many months, sometimes on trial before rulers and kings. But the characteristic of their speech is boldness. So what would it look like for you in your context? When will boldness be next required of you in your context? Well, sometime you'll have to speak up. When that happens, consider like these early believers, the scope of this world, all of human history, has been pitched against God and the gospel. But it's always been this way. And consider who we're praying to, the sovereign Lord, the God who has created all things and has spoken. And speak out knowing that we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit for doing so. Maybe it looks like uh, this week grabbing a few of the, the Christmas flyers of... Uh, what's going on at the barge this Christmas and having them on your desk. When somebody asks about them, you say, I'm going to this carol service this weekend. How about joining me uh, along? Here's your invite. Maybe it looks like saying uh, to your boss that bringing your whole self to work uh, would mean that as a Christian, you'd like to put something on the company intranet uh, this Christmas. Or suggesting to a co-worker that, uh, maybe you, you grab a coffee and chat more about Jesus sometime because your, your question's a really good one and it deserves a more full answer. Maybe it looks like encouraging your child's teacher to look at Jesus for themselves before they dismiss your six-year-old understanding of him. This Christmas time, would you pray for boldness to speak the gospel? Whatever your context, whatever your situation, pray to be a little more bold. It doesn't have to be force-feeding your family gospel outlines at every opportunity. But pray that however bold you are, however bold you feel this morning, pray this week that the Lord would fill you with his Holy Spirit to make you a little bit more bold. That God would make you just a bit more bold this time. And look at the immediate answer <laughs> that these early Christians get. Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word with boldness. The miraculous shaking of the place they are in, it's a visible sign to them that this prayer is being answered. They're filled with the Holy Spirit for this task. Now, all the other times in Acts when they speak with, with boldness, we don't hear about the place shaking in answer to this prayer. And when we today pray for, for boldness, uh, we won't have the place uh, shaking. Now, I don't think we should expect it to take place um, and, and, and for where we are to be, to be shaking when we pray this prayer. I think this is a sort of one-off sign to these believers that God answers this prayer. Uh, these uh, signs show that God is now present with them in their trials, their tribulations, in the face of threats, silencing God is there with them. I think it's how uh, all those examples throughout the book of Acts of them speaking with boldness, they can look back and say, we know that God answers this prayer because this time he shook this place. It's how Paul can say in Romans 5, we rejoice in our afflictions. It's because God says, call upon me in the day of tribulation and I will deliver you. In the shaking of the place they're in, they become unshakable. And it's been this way ever since. The power of the Holy Spirit was renewed and increased in these believers uh, so that they didn't hide, they didn't stop because of the threats of these noble rulers, but instead they proclaimed Jesus all the more freely, all the more courageously. It's the nature of the growth of the church there, sort of like a, a vine being chopped back with the threats of rulers. And the Lord encourages more fruit from it, sustains it so that more fruit is born. So maybe today you don't feel super bold. The encouragement is 
look back at the answer of this prayer and understand that God has been answering this prayer ever since. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be here today. The gospel wouldn't have gone out in all the nations that it has. The gospel wouldn't have brought us together in 21st century London, Canary Wharf, if this prayer wasn't a prayer that God answers. Can you imagine what your life would look like if the Lord answered this prayer for you this week? Maybe just call to mind the the people, the conversations that you've had in the, the previous months, previous times where you've thought this hasn't gone quite right. If only I had a little bit more boldness. And imagine what What would it look like for God to answer this prayer for boldness, bold speaking, uh, this week for you? Can you imagine what our church would look like if God answered this prayer for each one of us here? So next time we see a headline saying, and Christians are wrong about this, old-fashioned, outdated, impossible uh, to hold genuine Christian beliefs in the public sphere like this. (coughs) Next time... You're told Christians ought to be quiet, keep themselves to themselves, uh, keep your faith out of the public square, out of work. And pray for boldness for ourselves, uh, for our church family, for others, for these people we see in headlines. Pray, knowing that we're praying to the sovereign Lord who created all things, who spoke and said that uh, it will be this way. The whole world will pitch itself against God and the gospel. It has always been this way. And yet, loves to answer this prayer. Look back at Acts 4, the shaken place, and go out in boldness, becoming unshakable. We're going to pause and reflect for a moment in quiet, and then we're going to continue our service in prayer.